J'ai maintenant le plaisir de vous présenter notre conférencière invitée. In January 2016, Dr. Fabiola Gianotti became the first female Director General of the European Organization for Nuclear Research, known as CERN. She has been a research physicist in the physics department there since 1994 and is an honorary professor at the University of Edinburgh. She is also a corresponding member of the Italian Academy of Sciences and foreign associate member of the National Academy of Sciences of the United States. Dr. Gianotti has worked on several CERN experiments, uh, for instance, from 19, oh, 1909 to 2013, she was the project leader for the ATLAS experiment at CERN. ATLAS is a scientific uh, equipment that was instrumental in the Higgs boson discovery in 2012. And I might add that the CFI, the Canada Foundation for Innovation, has supported the research infrastructure for the ATLAS experiment, helping to position Canadian scientists as key players in this major international science project. Professor Gianotti est ou a été membre de nombreux comités scientifiques, notamment en France, en Allemagne, aux Pays-Bas et aux États-Unis. Elle est également membre du comité consultatif scientifique du secrétaire général des Nations Unies. She was included among the top 100 most inspirational women by the UK's The Guardian newspaper. She was ranked fifth in Time Magazine's Personality of the Year in 2012 and included among the te top 100 most influential women by Forbes Magazine in 2013. Mesdames et Messieurs, accueillons ensemble notre conférencière, Dr. Fabiola Gianotti. Good morning, Dr. Winter, and good morning, distinguished members of uh, CFI. Uh, I'm very pleased and honored to be here. C'est un plaisir, un honneur d'être avec vous ce matin, et, et aussi de, vous, de pouvoir vous remercier directement pour votre contribution très importante au, au, au projet uh, du, du CERN. I'm very pleased, in particular, to have the opportunity to thank you directly for your very strong contribution to and uh, participation in, in, in CERN's adventure, which is, of course, an adventure of research, but much more than that. And I will try to, uh, uh, to, uh, to explain and to list some of the points. So first of all, CERN is the largest um, laboratory in the world for particle physics. Um, from the uh, administrative point of view, is an, uh, is an intergovernmental organization based in Geneva. Uh, its primary mission is science. So we do fundamental research in particle physics, and particle physics is the most fundamental of all sciences, because it really looks to the, to the most to the elementary constituents of, of matter and of the universe, to the, to the elementary bricks of which we are all, all made. Um, in order to accomplish our scientific goal and our research, which has been awarded in the, uh, over the years uh, by very important, with very important discoveries, the last one is the Higgs boson in 2012, and Nobel Prizes um, assigned, attributed to um, scientists working at CERN. So in order to accomplish our scientific goals, we need to develop um, cutting edge um, instruments in three main domains, particle accelerators, particle detectors, and computing infrastructures and to push back the limit of knowledge in many, in many, in many domains, from cryogenics to um, electronics to vacuum technologies and so on and so forth. And these, uh, um, these advances in technology are transmitted to society. So everybody knows that the World Wide Web was invented at CERN. It was introduced uh, as a mean of facilitating exchanging among the scientists of the, of the laboratory, and it has since then change the way um, um, society access uh, to information. But I will give some other um, examples of the impact of, of the tangible impact of, of research at CERN on everyday life. Another very important mission for us is education and training. Training of tomorrow scientists, so physicists, engineers, technicians, but also high school students and high school teachers through a certain number, a large number of initiatives that I will try to, um, to, uh, to list. And CERN is also um, a concrete example of, of, of uh, peaceful collaboration across the world because it's able to attract 
about 17,000 scientists, mainly physicists, from all over the world, more than 110 different nationalities. They come to CERN and they work together peacefully, regardless of their origin, country, ethnicity, etc. So CERN was founded in 1954 by uh, uh, some visionary politicians and, and scientists uh, with the twofold goal of um, re-establishing excellence, research excellence in Europe after the war, and also foster um, peaceful collaboration among European countries again after the disasters of the war. Today, CERN has 22 member states, uh, not all of them from Europe, for instance, Israel, and seven associate member states, including, for instance, India and Pakistan. And so you can already see from this geographical map there are countries like India and Pakistan sitting at the same table, Cyprus, Greece, and Turkey as well, etc. So the, the yearly budget is 1.1 billion Swiss francs. Uh, I, I, I like to use more friendly, um, friendly units, especially at breakfast. So 1.2 billion, 1.1 billion Swiss francs corresponds on average to one cappuccino per European citizen per year. On average, on average, because you know that in Europe, Southern Europe, the cappuccino is very good and very cheap, and then you move north and okay. Fine. Anyway, so this budget is contributed by the member state countries in proportion to their NNI. So the, the largest contributor is Germany, about 20% of the budget, followed by the UK, France, Italy, Spain, and so on and so forth. And associate member states contribute 10% of what they would contribute to their theoretical contribution if they were a member state. So if Germany was an associate member state, it will contribute 2% of the budget instead of 20%. Now, this budget is used to conceive, develop, operate, update the uh, infrastructure, technical infrastructure, accelerators, workshop, laboratories used by the worldwide uh, community in particle physics, accelerator-based particle physics, to do uh, their research. And this slide shows the, the map, the geographical map, with the origin of this, uh, of this worldwide particle community working at CERN, 17,000 researchers coming from all over the world, from member states, as you can see here in blue, but also from non-member states, and also from countries, you see, like Azerbaijan, like uh, Montenegro, like Malaysia, uh, like, uh, like also several uh, countries in Africa where we are trying actually to solicit a bit more the participation of, of, of um, different states, Madagascar, etc. And you can see that Canada contributes with about 200 researchers. This is, uh, uh, this is the number of people excellent scientists from Canada working with us, but there are also other important indicators that I will uh, mention later on. Some of these scientists come actually from countries that are at war or, or we do not even recognize to each other the right to existence, and yet they work together. We have Israel and, and, and uh, Iran and, uh, and so on and so forth, Taiwan and China, etc. So if you think that these scientists are a bit, um, you know, quite old and, and boring, you are wrong, because a distribution of the age of the 17,000 uh, scientists working at CERN shows that the peak is at 27 years. So actually, most of the CERN population is made of young people. If you come to CERN and you walk in, in the morning or lunchtime in our cafeteria, you find young people from all over the world, all kinds of colors, languages, it's really, and they are really the, the engineer, they're really the driving force of, of the laboratory. I would like to make a little bit of a, of a, a comment on the um, contribution of women. So today, on average, uh, women scientists are at the level of 12%. The total, the fraction is 20%, but there is, of course, administrative personnel. So when you look at the scientists, engineers, and, 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 and physicists, and computing engineers, women are at the level of 12%. So it seems low, but actually there has been a lot of progress, because in 1995, we were at the level of 4%. Today we are 12%. And if you look, not at the average, but at the, uh, at the fraction in the younger generation, at the level of postdocs, women are at the level of 23%. So there is a very, very good trend. And this also thanks to a certain number of initiatives that we have been putting in place and uh, following up uh, over the past years that really we now see the, be the, be the benefit of this and will continue to, um, to make sure that diversity, gender diversity, is, is, is really uh, taken uh, in, into account. We have thousands of PhD students at CERN, okay? What do they do 
after they complete their PhD or their, or their first postdoc. Typically, 10%, only 10% of them remain in research, um, in part because some of them want to move on to do something else or because the jobs in research are not so many. So actually, if you look at their career, about 45% go to the private sector. The, the, the others go to public sector in other, in other fields. And you see here uh, the um, kind of industry where they go, computing, engineering, even finance, etc. And a recent poll uh, shows that more than 95% of, of the people, of the young people who left CERN, are actually very, very extremely happy, extremely happy with their current job. Which means that the education, the training they get in, um, through their activity at CERN, in their institution of course, but uh, through activities at CERN, uh, gives them a very strong CV because they're able to find a, a job, which is not obvious nowadays, but also a job at the level of their expectation and their talent. So I think we have also this mission of training and educating people for society more broadly, not just for, for research. So because of, we have so many people and because it's very, it's very, mass, uh, mass, uh, very much enshrined in our convention, educational and training activities are very important. So of course we have schools for young scientists, for PhD students and postdoc in accelerators, computing and particle physics. And we started this school, sorry, we started this school back, how do I go back? Uh, okay, okay, it doesn't matter. So we started these schools in, um, in Europe, and then we moved also to Latin America, so the last one were in Ecuador and in, in, in Peru. Then we moved to, thank you, we moved to um, Asia, and more recently we, we have been also in Africa. We co-organized uh, schools in Africa, so we started in 2010 in South Africa, then Ghana, then Senegal, and in, in Rwanda. And then we have also programs for high school students and high school teachers. Teachers are very important because they are a, 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 multi, a multiplier. A, a teachers, of course, can, can, can send messages to uh, several students. So we have been running for 15 years this teacher's program. Over summer, teachers from all over the world come to CERN, and during a few days, or from a few days to a couple of weeks, they receive a compliment in uh, their um, training and education on hands-on experimental uh, physics. And this program has been extremely successful, and we have welcomed since the, the, the beginning of the, or the end of the 90s, uh, more than 10,000 teachers at, at CERN. And every year, we have about 120,000 visitors from all over the world. Uh, more than 60% of these visitors are uh, uh, high school um, uh, students. And actually, uh, we, uh, we receive three times as, as many requests that we cannot accommodate. I think this year we are at the level of 150,000 already, but because, of course, we have, of course, the site is very big, there are many things, many, many things to visit, but also, uh, you know, guides are scientists of the laboratories, it's, the, the work is done by, by, by us, and so we have a limited capacity, and we are trying now to expand it with a new, with a new project. And I would like to take this opportunity to mention one very nice uh, initiative where actually Canada has been a protagonist this year. So we have a nice project which is called Beamline for School. So every year we invite uh, high school students, two teams from um, high school, to submit a proposal uh, for an experiment at CERN, at the Beamline at CERN. And this proposal are um, um, examined by, uh, by the same um, scientific committees that select the real experiments at CERN. So this proposal got get to these committees and they examine this proposal and then they choose every year two winning teams. So over the past year, uh, the winners have been from the Netherlands, Greece, Italy, South Africa, Poland, UK, and in 2017, one of the two winners is from Canada. These kids then come to CERN in September, they spend two weeks there, and they do their experiments, help of course by CERN uh, scientists, and it's a wonderful experience uh, for them. So this year, the competition was won, uh, and there were, I think, in total something like 180 applicants, 180 teams from all over the world applying. It's been won by a team in Italy and a team uh, from uh, Canada. This is from uh, Ecole Secondaire Catholique Pierre de Galinea in Cambridge. And they came to CERN and they performed their experiments. And you see here, I'm uh, totally uh, been uh, totally transformed into a dog Canadian, uh, Canadian citizen with, the, with, this, uh, with this nice, nice kit. So that was really very, very nice. Okay, so 
let's go now back to science. Our primary mission is research in particle physics. So what we do at CERN, we study the elementary particles, which also include the elementary constituents of matter, the electron and the quarks, and they are forces at the, at the most, the forces among them, at the most elementary uh, level. So we all know today that matter is made of atoms, and atoms are made by are made of a central nucleus surrounded by a cloud of electrons, and the nucleus is made of neutrons and protons, and neutrons and protons are made by smaller and more fundamental particles called the quarks, bound together by other fundamental particles called gluons. And as far as we know today, quarks and electrons are elementary particles. They cannot be cut into smaller pieces. So they are the most fundamental constituent of matters, the ordinary matter that we all know and we are all made of. So all the objects in this, this room, ourselves, even Dr. Runte, we are all made of electrons and quarks. So, and, uh, so um, physics at the uh, at modern accelerator and the Large Hadron Collider at CERN is the most powerful accelerator ever allows us to scrutinize matter at the level of the quarks. So on physical scale, smaller than 10 to the minus 18 meters, one billionth of a billion of a meter. So this accelerator can be seen as giant microscope that allows us to study not so much the cells as in biology, but the fundamental constituent of matter. And at the same time, this study of the very, very small allows us to understand the very, very big namely the structure and evolution of the universe. And, uh, and the reason is the following. We know today from cosmology and from many numerous precise now experimental observations that the universe had origin about 14 billion years ago from a big explosion called the Big Bang. At the beginning, the universe was extremely dense and made of a gas of three particles. So first of all, by studying the elementary particles, we can understand okay, what happened in the very uh, first instance of the universe life. Then, with time, the universe expanded and cooled down, and so the elementary particles started to get together to form first neutrons and protons, and then neutrons and protons to form the nuclei of the light elements, and then together with electrons to form atoms, and so forth, and so forth, and so, forth, and so on and so forth, up to the uh, macro, beautiful macro structure that we see today, stars, galaxies, and uh, planets, etc. There are essentially two complementary way, ways to study the universe and its evolution. One is telescopes. With telescopes, you can look at the, at the, at the present universe and uh, go back in, in time, looking at the macrostructure, supernovae, galaxies, planets, etc., and try to understand what happens at the very, at the very beginning. However, there's a kind of brick wall at 380,000 years after the Big Bang. So telescopes cannot go back looking at radiation cannot go beyond at earlier epoch than these 380,000 years from the Big Bang. And the reason is that at previous uh, epochs, the universe was so dense that the light was essentially trapped in this gas of free elementary particles that could not escape. So it never reached us. So in order to study earlier epochs, we have to use other uh, tools, and the main one is accelerators. So how do we do so in practice? So here I'm going to show, to, to discuss, um, I mean, the basic principle of particle physics at accelerators in a very, say, in a non-rigorous way. So I, I hope that it stays entre nous and doesn't go out of this, um, of this room. I see a camera, so I'm a bit, bit uh, worried, but uh, okay, fine. So what do we do? We accelerate two beams of particles, for instance, two beams of protons using accelerators. So we, we, we accelerate to the highest possible energies, and then we smash them. So accelerators are usually um, um, equipment, electric field and magnetic field housed in underground rings. And so these pictures show the underground ring of the Large Hadron Collider and these blue tubes contain high technology superconducting magnets. So we bring these two beams into a collision and in the collision several things happen. You can imagine the two protons that are smashed one against the others, they go into thousands of pieces, again, it's a, it's a, it's a very non-scientifically non, 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 non-rigorous picture, but goes into thousands of pieces so we can understand how the elementary components of these protons interact, the quarks, the gluon, etc. 
Second, in the collision, a lot of energy is produced, and this energy can transform itself into new particles. You remember Einstein said E equal mc squared. So to lose energy, energy can, become, can, can transform itself into matter. And the, the larger the energy of the, uh, the higher the energy of the collision, the more massive the particles you can produce. So that's why particles that have been uh, searched for, hunted for many, many years, and the Higgs boson has been hunted for almost 50 years at accelerators and, and laboratories across the world, has been discovered only recently at the Large Hadron Collider because only the LHC had enough energy to produce it. Note also that the collision, uh, the collision energy corresponds to the temperature that the universe had one millionth of a millionth of a second after the Big Bang. So in this localized high energy collision, we are able to reproduce the elementary interaction and particles that have characterized the early universe. So how do, you st do we study this collision in practice? Well, uh, we uh, surround the region where the two beams collide uh, with um, high-tech instruments that are called particle detectors made of different layers of different technology, technologies that allow us to ideally detect, reconstruct, measure the trajectory and identify every single particle produced in the collision. So with this detector, we have a full picture of the collision events. So if the, if the accelerator can be seen assimilated to giant microscope, these uh, particle detectors can be assimilated to um, big digital camera. However, this camera has to be very, very fast because the two proton beams at the LHC collide 40 million times a second. So it's really a very, very, uh, very, very uh, high rate. Now, the most, uh, the most uh, um, complex and, and ambitious and advanced uh, project in this uh, field is the Large Hadron Collider. So this is a, uh, an aerial view of the Geneva region. You can see here in the, in the background the Alps, uh, Lake Geneva here. Uh, this dashed white line shows the border between Switzerland here on the top part of the, uh, of the picture and France here. CERN headquarters are here. And this uh, ring um, indicates the location of the Large Hadron Collider. It's a 27 kilometer ring, 100 meter underground. So you don't see anything on the surface. You have to go down through the uh, access shaft. And operation started in 2010 when we first circulated two beam of protons in the two opposite direction and accelerated them at the at unprecedented energies and brought them into a collision at four point of the accelerators where four big particle detectors had been installed in four enormous underground caverns. And these um, experiments, these detectors are called uh, ATLAS, CMS, LHCB, and ALICE. And, um, only a couple of years after uh, Operation Startup, Atlas and CMS, which are the two biggest and more general purpose um, experiments, uh, reported the discovery of a new and very special particle, uh, the, the Higgs boson. And I would like to stress right away that Canadian scientists, research institution, industry, and CFI in particular, funding agency, have made a very significant contribution to the Atlas experiment, to the computing infrastructure, and to the accelerator. And I will come back to this um, later on. So the discovery of the Higgs boson led to the Nobel Prize for uh, Francois Angler and Peter Higgs, uh, two of the theorists who had uh, predicted the existence of such a very special uh, particle uh, in the early, in the early uh, 60s. And, uh, and in the um, motivation of the uh, Swedish Academy, um, it, it's, it's explicit mention, explicit mention the role of the Atlas and CMS experiment at the Large Hadron Collider in really um, detecting this uh, predict particle predicted many years ago. And for the expert in, in the room, these two plots are very close to my heart because they, they show uh, how the, the Higgs signal has been seen, observed by the Atlas and CMS experiment in the, in, in, in the 30 years of data taking. So uh, I open a technical parenthesis. The Higgs, the Higgs boson, once produced in this collision, uh, decay immediately. It, is, it disintegrates itself into other particles, known particles. So it can decay into two photons. So the two experiments have looked at the, at the data containing photon, the rents containing photon among their data. And if they look at the, at the spectrum, you see a smooth spectrum, as you expect from background processes. And then you see a peak a peak at the given mass, and when you subtract the background, you see these nice peaks. It's due to the production of the Higgs boson that came into, into two photons. 
Um, The LHC required really a big jump in the, in the concept and in the technology, and I will show you a couple of examples. The accelerator itself, this is a spectacular view of the LHC underground tunnel. You see here these blue um, two tubes. These are cryostat containing high technology superconducting magnet. This is the cryogenic line that is uh, keeping them uh, cold. So, the backbone of the accelerator is made of, and actually the, 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 the most important single element that allowed us to make a big jump in energy compared to previous accelerator is the development of 1,200 superconducting high-tech magnets built by three leading industries in Europe, Alstom in, in, in France, um, Ansaldo in Italy, and Babcock Merle in Germany. So you need, you know, what is difficult, which is, hard in a proton-proton in a, in a -proton collider is not to accelerate the protons. This is relatively easy. What is hard is to, keep, to guide them and keep them inside, uh, inside the ring, to store them inside the ring. And for that, you need magnets of very, 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 producing very high field. And to produce very high field, you need very high currents. Here we are talking about 12,000 ampere. And to produce high currents with uh, efficiency, you need to use superconducting materials that, you, that offer, that produce, provide very small resistance. If you use copper, you need an enormous amount of copper. It's a very, it's a very, it's a very inefficient process. So, but superconducting material like niobium titanium that you use for the uh, LHC becomes superconducting at very low temperature. So the LHC actually works at 1.9 Kelvin, uh, which is only two degrees above absolute zero, minus 271 degree Celsius. Uh, which actually makes of the, of the LHC the, the coldest place in the universe. We also say the coolest place in the universe. Okay, but it's by. Why the coldest place in the universe? Because, you know, I, I, I said at the beginning that the universe had origin uh, from a, a big explosion, the big bang at the beginning was very hot, and then it expanded and cooled down. So if you ask ourselves, what is the temperature of the universe today? And the answer is 2.7 Kelvin and the LHC works at 1.9 Kelvin. So we have, by the way, to reach this lower, uh, this very low temperature to a, a, super, a bath of 120 tons of superfluid helium, we use the largest cryogenic system in the world. And when the LHC operates, like in, in this moment, there are something like 200,000 billion protons in each beam colliding 40 million times a second in the experiment. So really, uh, really uh, a fantastic technological adventure. Uh, the experiments are also very challenging and extraordinary. So this is a view of Atlas, the biggest one, and the one where Canada has been you know, participating and participates in a very important way. This is a spectacular image and uh, uh, picture of Atlas. These are two human beings, and I can assure you that we didn't choose them to be particularly small. They are normal size, okay? And you see... The, the size of this fantastic object, and also the beauty of this object, which was not built for being nice, but for, for being useful, but actually artistically is so beautiful. Now, the size of Atlas is about half Notre Dame Cathedral in, in, Cathedral in Paris. If you look at the other experiment, CMS, it contains more iron than the Tour Eiffel, the Eiffel Tower, and as a weight twice as much as the Tour Eiffel. We use 3,000 kilometers of cable to bring the signal from the underground cavern to the, uh, to the um, surface uh, rooms where the, the data are stored. And every year, uh, the experiment, the LHC experiments, produce an amount of data, raw data, at the level of 10 to 15 petabytes. So, and, and the amount of data we have recorded so far uh, is, is, is comparable to YouTube, Twitter, and uh, Facebook, and all these things. So we are among the biggest producer and consumer of big data. Canada had a very important, a very big role in this adventure. Uh, it has contributed in a very important way to both uh, the experiment and to the um, accelerator with very with brains, with scientists, highest level scientists, with technologies and with industry. Uh, in Atlas, we have 10 institutes and universities from, from, uh, uh, from Canada and about 150 uh, active physicists and half of them are really PhD students. So again, you find a very, a very uh, young population across all the activities here uh, uh, at CERN. Uh, Canada has also contributed in a very important way to the LHC computing, which for the first time introduced a distributed model. In the past, 
that the computing resources usually were localized in their host laboratory. But with DHC, with the scale and the challenges of big data, this model was not possible. So we invented a new method, a new, a new, a new um, mechanism, a new model called uh, LHC Worldwide Computing Grid, where these resources are scattered across the world in a few 10 big centers, and uh, Triumph and SFU actually host one of them, and smaller university size center, and Canada has this tier two uh, center also in, um, in West and East uh, Canada. And CFI has been the sponsor of uh, um, the computing, Atlas Computing for Atlas Canada Computing. So we are very grateful for your, for your uh, contribution. And by the way, this LHC computing grid is also used by other disciplines, so not only by, by particle physics, although it has been it was driven by us. Um, some spectacular uh, uh, picture again. So this is one of the uh, two end caps um, um, part components of the Atlas detector, which close the forward region. So here you can see a cryostat. And this cryostat contains two liquid argon calorimeters. Uh, argon becomes li liquid at uh, um, 87 Kelvin, so you need to cool it down. And uh, it contains, in particular, the end cap and forward calorimeters. And this detector has been developed in Canada by Atlas scientists, built with Atlas, uh, built with Canadian technology and with uh, Canadian industry. So, the, the, the modus operandi in this big research infrastructure, like CERN, is in kind contribution of, of countries. So, countries do not put cash money on the table, countries spend the money in, uh, in the country uh, with project, with building components for these big instruments, uh, and the supervision of the work is with the universities and institutions in the country, so in Canada, and these components are built by the industry in the country. Okay. Canada has also contributed in an important way to the accelerator itself uh, by building 52 warm magnets that have been uh, used in two uh, critical points of the accelerator in the so-called so -called cleaning insertions, where the beam is clean. The, the beam has a lot of halo, and it's very important to uh, cut the halo tails. And so these uh, high-tech warm magnets have been uh, built in uh, Aston in Quebec with the supervision of Triumph. So you see all this uh, nice technology and uh, this, uh, say, adventure at the limit of uh, human capabilities, and then you ask your question, why? So why are you, we doing all this? And the reason is that DLHC has been, uh, has been conceived and built in order to address some outstanding, some of the most important outstanding questions in particle physics today. The first question had to do with the, with, the, with the masses of the elementary particles. We didn't know before the discovery of the Higgs boson how and why is it possible that some elementary particles are massless. For instance, photons. Photons are the constituent of light. Of light. This room is full of photons. Okay? Photons are massless particles, and they travel at the speed of light. And there are other particles, like, for instance, the W particle, the W boson, also discovered at CERN in the early 80s, which is responsible, for instance, for the thermonuclear, thermonuclear uh, reactions in the sun, and so for the heat uh, we receive and the light we receive, which are massive. The W boson has a mass which is eight, 80 times the mass of the proton. Uh, the Higgs mechanism allows to, uh, us to explain how this can happen and at which point in the universe evolution this, uh, this uh, breaking of the symmetry, say, between massless particle and massive particle happen. So this question has been at least in large part uh, um, answered with the discovery of the Higgs boson. You may argue, but who cares about the masses of elementary particles and the Higgs boson? But actually, we should care. Because remember, I, I told you that we are all made of electron and quarks. And if electron and quarks were massless, atoms will not stick together. Atoms will not exist. So the matter we know, the ordinary matter we are all made of, will not be there. The universe will not be there. It will be completely different, and we will be completely different. So it's a very key question also to our own existence. But there are many other questions that we are, um, we are addressing with the Large Hadron Colliders and other facilities in, in the world, in particular in Canada. Um, one, uh, one question has to do with the dark universe. When you look uh, in the, uh, at night at the night sky and you see stars, galaxies, beautiful planets, etc., you should think that what you see there is just 5% of what is out there. Okay? So only 5% of the universe is made of the ordinary matter that we are all made of. All the rest is a question mark and is called the dark universe. 
It means that the dark universe actually is made of form of matters and energy that we don't know. And for this reason, they are called dark matter and dark energy. We know today from some precise measurement that dark matter accounts for 25% of the universe and dark energy about 70% of the universe. And the baryonic matter, the matter we are all made of, is only 5%. So it's exciting to see that there is still a lot to discover, 95% of the universe. It's also a bit embarrassing as a scientist that actually we know only 5% of it. But that's it. And so DLHC is one of the tools, instruments that may allow us to uh, produce in the collision of the high energy protons, the particle that constitutes the dark matter. We don't know what this particle is. Um, the name dark not only indicates our ignorance, but also the fact that this form of matter and energy do not interact with our instruments, okay? So you will, could ask, okay, how do we know they are there? We know they are there from indirect measurements. For instance, movement of, uh, of the galaxies that, should be, uh, that are based on gravitation, gravitational force that indicates there is more, much more gravitation, gravitational matter out there. So at DLHC, we could produce the particle that constitute the dark matter. Now, I would like to stress that because we don't know the composition of dark matter, we don't know what, what it is made of, could be made of very light particles, or very heavy particles, we have some ideas, but we don't know. There is no single approach that can guarantee that we'll discover it. So we are looking for dark matter at the LHC, but there are other approaches in the world. For instance, at Snow Lab here in Canada, people are looking for dark matter by building big, in, big detectors underground at Snow Lab, and then looking at possible dark matter particles coming from the intergalactic halo and interacting with these detectors. So these are complementary approaches, and we have to pursue all of them in order to not only to increase our chances of solving the mystery, but also to once, hopefully, this particle, uh, dark matter particle is discovered, being able to understand its features and the, the underlying theory. Another, another uh, question that we are addressing now is why is the universe only made of matter? Essentially, antimatter does not exist at the free, the free way in the universe. We can produce it artificially. We do it at CERN every day. We send a beam on a, on a target and we produce a lot of antimatter particle. Actually, we have an antimatter facility where Canada is again is very, very strong involved in a couple of experiments, okay? Producing antiproton and anti-hydrogen. However, if you look at the universe, there is very little antimatter. The universe is only made of matter. And this we don't understand because we think that at the time of the Big Bang, matter and antimatter were produced in the same proportion. And then some kind of imbalance, imbalance happened in the course of the evolution of the universe that, and, and, and the antimatter disappeared and only, un, uh, only matter survived. And we don't understand why. We only understand part of it, but not really the full, uh, the full size of the, of the problem. We cannot explain it fully. And so on and so forth. And I would like to uh, stress that a certain scientific program is not just the Large Hadron Collider. We have many other facilities which address uh, these questions. And Canada has been and is strongly involved in many of them and really playing a key role in all of these very important experiments for the future of our, uh, for, the, for understanding these fundamental uh, questions. Now, one word on the next step. The Large Hadron Collider started operation in 2010. And uh, it is expected to complete its nominal phase in 2023. And then we have already started the process for upgrading uh, the Large Hadron Collider to increase a little bit the energy, not that much, but in particular to increase the intensity of the two beams so as to increase the probability when these two beams collide to produce even the most rare uh, particles. And this project is called High Luminosity LHC. Um, it will be uh, in, uh, installed in, uh, in the, at the beginning of the next uh, decades during a long shutdown, and then operation will start in 2026 or so. And I would like to thank CFI because you have contributed in a very important way with a 30 million grant to the upgrade of the Atlas experiment in two different phases, phase one and phase two, to, um, uh, to um, 
to be able to address, say, this outstanding question with increased opportunities and increased capability through the uh, high luminosity upgrade. And in particular, Canada is working on a very, very, is building now a very, very um, uh, important and crucial and technologically uh, challenging component, what we call the inner detector, the component which is closest to the beam, so is, uh, is, is subject to, um, to the, the highest radiation level and to the most uh, um, messy environment because there are many, many particles. And, uh, uh, and this detector is essentially made of a 165 meter square meter of silicon strip center with pitch size 75 micron and a 60 million electronic channel. So really, really a, a, a step in, in, in the technology of silicon uh, detectors. And here you can see the construction of some hybrid circuits in, in, in Toronto. But we are also uh, upgrading the accelerator to, uh, to um, uh, reach the highest possible intensity, and we are now discussing with, with Canada and Canadian government uh, the, the, the possible contribution to some high-tech components co called crab cavities, which would allow us to increase, really, the rate of the collisions at the interaction uh, points. And Canada has all the expertise with Triumph and with your industry to build these uh, this objects. So I would like to conclude with a couple of more general remarks. One of the most, uh, uh, one of the most uh, common, frequent questions I, I, I get, and as I used to say, actually, is the second most frequent question, because the most frequent question I get is, how do you feel being the first female director general, sir? So after answering how I feel to be uh, the first woman leading, sir, then the second next question is, will the X boson change our life? And uh, my, my reply is, it uh, already has. Because as I, as I mentioned before, uh, our instruments are so, uh, in particle physics, not only accelerator based, I'm talking also what you do here, for instance, a snow lab. These instruments are so ambitious that we have to develop cutting edge technologies in many fields. I mentioned cryogenics, I mentioned vacuum technologies. For instance, the, the roof of Geneva Airport is equipped with solar panels. And these solar panels use vacuum techniques developed at CERN. And so these technologies from the World Wide Web, from uh, grid computing to, uh, uh, to uh, cargo screening and many other, many other applications uh, really have now become part of everyday life. But I would like to mention two of them in, in the medical field. Um, uh, there are many accelerators worldwide today, about 30,000 uh, accelerators, only a few of them, perhaps a handful, or few, a few handful of them, are used in fundamental research. And most of them are used actually for medical application. One of them is what we call hadron uh, therapy, which consists in uh, it's a complementary therapy to um, the more traditional uh, radiation therapy. You can, bombard your, uh, you can bombard the tumor with X-rays, and this is what you do with the conventional uh, radiotherapy, but you can also bombard the tu tumor with protons or light ions, like carbon ions. And the advantage of proton beams and light ion beams is that they are very much focused. So they can be really sent to the tumoral tissue and do not touch the, health, the surrounding healthy tissue. On the other hand, X-rays spread over a over larger area. So there are some tumors that are located at very delicate position that should be treated or can be treated or are treated with adron therapy. And these, these accelerators are based on technologies developed at CERN and in other institutes. Um, in our field. Another example is in, in, the, in, the, in the field of medical imaging, one of the most, perhaps the most uh, popular scanner today for cancer diagnostic is called PET, positron emission tomography, and is based on detectors developed at CERN. And uh, a few years ago, a, a, a journalist from The, from the, uh, from the Economist came to, uh, to CERN and, uh, sorry, the, the slide is cut. The title is Titans of Innovation. And he argued, he wrote an article on The Economist, it was, I think, 2013, 2014, claiming that it could be that big science has more to pitch to big business than vice versa. And he spent a few days at CERN, and then on a Saturday morning he was working in our, working in our uh, cafeteria, and he was really, uh, how to say, I think he was really touched and impressed by these screens showing live what was going on in the accelerator underground, in the experiment, etc. And he said, few firms can, uh, sorry, I have to leave here, can inspire such commitment and no mission statement or desk message will change that. So he found that, that big science is also is so able to, uh, is able to, to inspire people so much and in, in such a, in such a uh, fantastic way, more than what, uh, what happens in, in sometimes in industry. And I would like to summarize a couple of statements here that perhaps are, are important to, to this audience. 
As I mentioned, research at CERN is a driver of innovation because of the complexity of the, uh, of the goals. Um, but there are more in general. I'd like to open a short parenthesis if you allow me. Uh, it's very difficult to predict the impact of fundamental research on society. Will the X boson itself be useful to society in uh, um, 30, 40 years from now? I don't know. I cannot tell you. But I, I, can, I, can, I can share with you a, a, a comparison. Think of the br main breakthrough in fundamental science, fundamental physics of the last centuries, quantum mechanics and, and general relativity, okay? There is nothing, if you think of quantum mechanics, there is nothing at the time where it was developed more far away from real life because quantum mechanics has to do with the microscopic world, which has low that are very different from the role that govern macroscopic world. And yet, without quantum mechanics, modern electronics will not be there and our world will not be this world, okay? So fundamental research has, of course, a huge impact on society, but it's on the long term, so that's why it needs to be sustained. And it needs to have sustained by governance, by public money, because these projects are very long and their impact does not come a, a few months or a few years later, but perhaps after decades. But it can be, can be really disruptive and can be really change the fate of society. Uh, second, I would like to stress that we do you have seen this monster detector and monster accelerators, and you cannot build them at CERN. What we do at CERN and in the, in the participating institute, like here in Triumph and, and in universities, we build prototypes and then we share these prototypes with industry. Of course, 27 kilometer of high-tech accelerator cannot be built at CERN. It's built by industry. But the, the, the relation we have uh, with industry is not a client-supplier relation. We just not go to industry and tell them, please give me this because usually the, this does not exist in industry and they do not know how to build it because it's so challenging. So what we do is we work together. We, we do R&D work together with industry. Uh, industrial partners come to CERN, or we go to industry and we work together, we build prototypes, we build, do R&D until we reach a satisfactory product and then the industry builds 100,000 um, uh, replicas of, of that product. So we grow together and actually, what the industrial partner working with us at CERN tells us that working with CERN, increasing their uh, high technology uh, capabilities, uh, some, the, the work they have with CERN sometimes is not the, the most important component of their financial business. Sometimes CERN just requires a few high tech components, some very high tech vacuum valves, for instance. And the business of the industry, of course, uh, most of the money does not come from that. But they have to develop their technology so much that then this opens other venues and other possibilities, so to, to do business with other uh, research infrastructure like ASO, ESA, and also private, uh, private uh, clients, but also it gives them a mark of credibility. In, in Europe, if you have been working for CERN as an in, in, in industry, then you are considered to be a very, very high level industry. And so that's open, of course, sometimes uh, uh, unrelated market areas. And finally, I would like to conclude, this is my last slide, sorry for taking so much time. Uh, with the fact that we talked nowadays about the CERN model, which is not just the CERN model, I think it's the model of the discipline you find also here in a collaboration in, the, in Canada, Snow Lab, etc. So uh, we have been the subject of uh, even thesis work of sociologists and uh, businessmen and uh, corporate management and administrator because they don't understand how is it possible that thousands of people from all over the world are able to build such complex instruments successfully, okay, because they work very well, even beyond expectation. And, you know, if, if you take the Atlas collaboration with which you are a member uh, as, as Canada, it's made of 3,000 scientists from 38 different countries. And if you look at the monster detector I showed before, it has been designed and built by teams of engineers and physicists and technicians scattered all over the world and it works very well. So how is it possible that, that it, 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 so there are several recipes, of course, several, uh, several, uh, several um, um, reasons, but I think I try to, to list some of them here. First of all, the hierarchy in this big collaboration like Atlas comes from the intellectual contribution. It doesn't come from your formal position. For, I've been project leader of Atlas, but if the youngest student in the collaboration has the good idea to solve the problem, the collaboration follows and thus, and, and, and so the, the youngest people are able to really have an impact on the course of the experiment. And this is very, very, very mot mot motivating. The, uh, the organization, there is a structural, is a structure and some organization, but this organization has to be very 
light because the, the engine of, of, uh, of, of, um, of research you know, comes from ideas. And if there is too much bureaucracy, then the ideas are completely you know, uh, 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 cut. And, and in particular, the young people do not really feel contributing to with their ideas and their initiatives. Decisions are taken by consensus. Consensus does not mean that 3,000 physicists agree because it's impossible. But consensus means that important decisions are discussed openly. And then, of course, the leadership has to take to draw conclusions. But at least things are discussed openly. But the most important point is that we are all animated by the same passion for physics and for knowledge. And this is something that, uh, you know, we think that uh, as scientists, like a big the arts, I think science and arts are very close to each other. Science, knowledge, and the arts are really values that transcend the interest of a country, of a region, and uh, are common to human beings because they are the highest expression of the human beings as clever beings. They are expression of our curiosity, ingenuity, creativity. And so we are all animated by this passion for, for science, which is a strong glue and a strong driver toward a common, a common um, objective. Thank you very much. Thank you.